the river is something that is really critical to people. It's not incidental that our cities happen to be near rivers. It's not an accident of geography. Our cities are there for the very reason that rivers give us transportation and agriculture and so on. And I think that there's a part of river culture, you know, uh, it's not incidental. We're all river people, right? So I started building this boat several years ago. I had a kind of a crappy job and so I was needing an escape on weekends. And I like this idea, you know, instead of like having a crappy job, the weekends I might get on a little shanty boat somewhere and sit on a porch that I could put in a body of water. At first I thought, oh, maybe I'll make like a, I'll build something up on like an old pontoon boat that somebody doesn't want or need. And then I started thinking about how pontoons tend to flip and if you put a cabin on it, maybe that's not such a great idea. And then it kind of just evolved from like sort of this idea like, oh, maybe we could build a boat. I don't know. I don't know nothing about building boats. I've never built a boat before to actually building a boat. Then when I was doing my MFA work, I realized like, you know, this would really kind of be a perfect project to not just put in a river somewhere and go down the river, which is fine and adventure is beautiful, but like, how do I give something back to those communities that I'm part of? And so the idea was to have a boat that I go down the river, but then I stop in river communities and interview people and ask them about their lives and about river communities. Louise, can you point out where your house was? It's you gotta go under the bridge in order to find it. Because it was the other side of the bridge. Then that took shape and became this formal project that I've been doing for the last three years. One of the questions I've heard more than once on the way here was, did you make the boat or buy it, right? Yeah. And, yeah, like, we've wondered, like... Did you make that? <laughs> yes. Where would you buy it? Did Shanty you buy that? Service. Yeah, Shanty Boat Mart. <laughs> Shanty Boat Inc. You know they're having a special, actually, .com. at Shanty Boat, Shanty Boat, Shanty Boat. I got plans from a really old company that was around in the 50s and basically the plans had barely changed over the years and adapted the plans. It was a more conventional looking houseboat in the plans. The bottom was all made from plywood with fiberglass over it and mostly new materials. But then when we got to the decks and started building the cabin, all of that is all reclaimed materials. So we did things like disassemble a hundred year old chicken coop and use that for much of the cabin materials or go to the dump on a regular basis and get wood that's been cast off. So almost everything's made from something. I mean, it's funny, like everything has a story, right? The deck was old fence boards. I just cut off the rotted place and those became the deck boards. This is all just uh, reclaimed corrugated iron that's been galvanized. I don't even remember where I got it. I think a lot of it came from the chicken coop and there was a neighboring building that we disassembled. Just kind of had it in storage. By storage, I mean like a pile in my backyard. We just turned that pile into a roof later and then, you know, some of these rust out or get messed up here at the edge and we replace them when they need to be. And... Historically, there were tin roofs. All right, I think people use whatever they could. So, you know, like if you were on a creek where up the creek there was a lumber mill that would throw all this cut ends 
into the creek and they would all wash ashore where you were, well, then you'd build a shanty or a shanty boat out of whatever you could get. This is actually part of the 100-year-old chicken coop that we disassembled. Some of them had been painted and some hadn't. Some we turned in because we liked the color on that side versus the other side. And I mean, it's a ridiculous boat on almost by any measure. It has a gabled end with windows on either side. It catches the wind. It's super high and it's just not very boaty. It's more housey than boaty. And I, I just did that because I liked it more than because I thought it was an efficient boat design. Like, I, we found these just at a place in Knott'sville that we just had these like little shelf brackets and we're like, oh, I've been wanting to put something like that on the back roof just to kind of support this board. But then it doesn't really support the board that much, but it looks really nice. So we left the, we left the price tag on, we thought it was funnier. So you have a, um, a a kitchen, is it a camp stove? Uh, yeah, I think it's a camp stove. It is a design that has worked for uh, probably a century. So, you know, it's a, it's a full working kitchen, you know. We have all the amenities, including running water. So you're pumping water from a tank? Yeah, enough from the river. You just plumbed it yourself? Yeah, everything we did ourselves. But the thing is, we don't know anything about anything. So like when we wanted to do a thing, we just do a thing. And if it didn't work, we'd redo a thing. So it's like, how do we build shelves? I don't know. We build them like this? No, that sucks. Let's do it this other way. Strap down at least. With the, with the bike inner tubes, yeah. Where do you sleep? Um, there's also a loft up above here. If I wanted to go up into the loft, I'd just step on our sketchy chair and then step on our sketchy table and then just walk up the ladder and pull myself up. It's not easy or graceful, but it certainly works. So you actually put a full couch in here. Yeah, there's a couch. And actually, I don't know that it fits through the doors anymore. I can't remember if we actually put it in after, before. How big is the boat? Um, the boat is 20 foot, 20 foot long, okay. and uh, it's about 8 foot wide. It's, the cabin's 10 foot by 8. It's also like, like maybe 11 feet high inside, so think about cubic feet. Cubic feet, it's a lot. I didn't know what a shanty boat was until I met Wes. It's surprisingly like home. So what did we decide? Potatoes and eggs? Cheese? That's the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> Though right now it's actually just a sump of relatively cool water. <laughs> oh, aren't you glad how organized that is? I am so glad. <laughs> Even though it's a historical aesthetic, it's not like going onto a, a modern boat that you just, it, it feels a little foreign to me. This is completely like home. Do you have the deep fryer out? Yeah, um, deep fryer's in the, in the basement. Um, we could use the oven. I didn't grow up in a, a little cabin or anything like this, but it just feels so warm and inviting and it's fun to experience that. We don't really have a basement, but we do have an <laughs> oven. It unfolds to a cube about one foot by one foot. So you sometimes will pull that out if you, you really want Yeah, if we want to bake a pie. Hardest stove on earth. People frequently give us stuff for the boat, which is great. Like, we just had a scheme where we would get free boats and then we just take off like a few items and then we just like freebie them back into the into the free stuff stream. <laughs> Things like cleats to wrap ropes around on deck pulled off of old boats. The rest of the boat was all made from scratch. So is it composting toilet? Uh, yeah, poop in a bucket. So then later you dump it when it's full. And then you add sawdust and it doesn't smell. Or it smells more like you have hamsters. So how does it go? It's just gas and you're just pretty it's, basic? Yeah, it's like a boat. You know, we cannibalize this from an old boat, right? Oh, so okay. somebody gave us a free boat. So we removed the steering wheel and removed the controller, bought a motor, and so you turn a key and the boat moves. This type of boat, this type of home, was common in the 50s in some of these regions? Well, I mean, in the 50s, like in popular mechanics, there were, you know, in the 40s and 50s, people had a bit more leisure time after World War II, and so people were building little houseboats and stuff. 
But the designs are much, much older. So this is a, this idea of like a barge bottom flat boat. That's something that has not really changed since 150 years. So there are memoirs of people creating houseboats and shanty boats from the late 19th century into the early 20th century and then the mid 20th century. And all those boats have pretty much the same design, a barge bottom flat boat. And it was used as, as sort of a, a second residence, like a houseboat we think of today, or were they used to live in? Oh yeah, no, absolutely to live in. Like, you know, if you have nothing and you're able to scavenge materials from a ruined house, a ruined building or whatever, then maybe you have the capability to build a shanty boat. And so people built shanty boats. Largely after the 50s, you had a lot of urban renewal projects where they started turning their attention back toward the river. Then, particularly during the 70s, when the river started being cleaned up, you got, I don't know, sort of a form of gentrification where people who for generations maybe had lived along the river suddenly were not welcome there because now money had moved in and they created river walks. And rather than it being just a muddy, stinky bank where all the human cast-offs could live. Now suddenly it was a park and it's beautiful and there's a river walk and we open up a couple of restaurants and so now those people aren't as welcome. So you know shanty boats really since the 50s haven't been a thing. You know there's still people who live aboard houseboats in marinas or in little out-of-the-way places but I don't know that you'd really call them shanty boats, right? There's not like the whole homemade aesthetic of people just scrabbling by and making their own thing. What about in Knoxville? What's the history? That's funny, I'm just learning it myself, right? Because I just finished an interview with somebody so he was saying, you know, when he was a kid growing up in the 60s, there were people living along the banks of some of the creeks and the river, but by the mid to late 70s, those people were all gone. And by the 80s, they had renewed the riverfront, and by the 90s, it was kind of a kick in place. And so all those people who used to live along the rivers in little homemade shacks and shanty boats instead were then displaced and I mean these days we'd probably call those people homeless folk right I mean even right here right so even though this boat's three four years old and is relatively brand new I mean the aesthetics is pretty anachronistic in the marina where we're next to these you know forty fifty thousand dollar yachts you know it's if you wanted something practical, you'd buy something like that, I guess, or like that. You know, there's a lot to be said for cute. Cute is cute. It makes you feel like a house. It makes you feel like a house. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much all fat. So we'll be rendering fat that we can use for the rest of the trip. We don't even need to use olive oil. For me, the role of what I do is not to just hang out on a shanty boat. It's just, you know, we just we have a ship's log. I'm gathering oral histories and personal narrative of people who live and work in the river. Life on the Mississippi, Huckleberry Finn. There is that, that, that connection to the sort of Huckleberry Finn. I'm sure you... I mean, sure, I'm sure it's even up here somewhere in one of these. <laughs> these are river memoirs. So, you know, like, just this book, right? This is Sutri by Cormac McCarthy. Uh. This is a semi-autobiographical novel about a guy who lives in a shanty boat alongside the Tennessee River in Knoxville. The bridge pictured on the cover is the bridge that we're standing near, you know? There's river memoirs here. There's reference books about rivers. 
for us, it's super important that the books aren't a thing that are stashed in our backpack. These are like an essential element of the project. I think of the project as a title, as this, The Secret History of American River People. You say a secret history. I mean, do you, think, do you think it's because it's something that people just aren't aware of? Yeah, for sure. Like the fellow who I interviewed just today said that, you know, there were people living along the banks of the river and along the creeks, and most people had no idea they were even here. And why would they, right? Like the, the river stank, it was the place where cities dumped their sewers. It's both by accident and kind of by intention, you know? You put things that you don't want to think about on the edges, right? Like maybe mentally, but also like, you know, in cities. And so you have all the light industrial and the heavy industrial and you have the pollution that's right along the edges where nobody can has to think about it. I'm interested in people who have a connection with the river, it's sort of like the social ecology of rivers and river communities. In some cases, it's people who don't have a connection to the river, but live in a river town. Like, why is that? That's a really interesting question. Is it that some people are welcome to the river and some people not? The clear places, the ice is slipperier and do shit. I'm, as much as possible, trying to ask like the hard questions about who has access to a river, who has access to adventure, who has access to, like us, a shanty boat on the river. And I think those questions are, are really critical. Whenever we talk about something that's really delightful, if we don't ask, well, who has access to that delight, then we're not really digging deep enough. Is, is, so it's a question of, of change, because you talk about how this used to be one of the cheapest ways of living, right, and, exactly. and it's changed. And now it's a boat, and a boat is a thing that is understood to be a thing that people who are upper crusty do. So kind of uncovering the history or examining What's really out in the open, but is not really examined, is I think really important. And I think that's kind of this idea of like postmodern history in which you're examining the little tales of people, the tales of you and I, the relationships in our lives, and the adventures we've had, and the hardships we've endured. Those are a form of history that is just as valid and just as legitimate as history with a capital H history that that makes the dominant narrative the, of the people who generally are the victors and the people who win and the people who write the history books. Is this what you thought it would be being out on the river? I mean I don't know, like I didn't really have much of a plan. You know, when you're running from something, you're just like running. Here, <laughs> it's often less about where you're going to than what you're running from. But I would say that when I conceived of the project and what it could be, it's exceeded all my wildest expectations. I have more fun and more delight on the river. The shanty boat is more comfortable than I would have ever guessed. <laughs> The people I meet are more generous and more interesting than I would have ever imagined. The river is more beautiful, the adventure is more interesting that I don't think I would have ever guessed. <laughs>